No mai hari mai. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa, inga reo, inga mana, inga waka. Welcome everybody tonight uh, to the inaugural lecture of Paul Teasdale Spittle. Uh, my name is Nick Smith and I'm the Vice-Chancellor and it's my huge pleasure to be able to introduce Paul. Um, in these sort of moments I get a list of all the incredible achievements of our uh, inaugural professors and the things that they've done and, and Paul's list is, is no different from any of the others and it's impressive and it's long and I will inflict quite a bit of it on you shortly. But before I get to that point, I wanted to make some, some personal comments about Paul. Um, I've just learnt uh, that Paul grew up in Birmingham. I already knew that he moved slightly north and did his PhD in Nottingham. But uh, he has neither a Birmingham accent or a Nottingham accent, I think, for all our benefits. He has this beautiful sort of BBC accent. <laughs> and I think that's significant, because I asked him um, why... Uh, he, he came to uh, Aotearoa and how he came to Teringa Waka. And he said, well, I looked at the job and it sounded quite of interesting. And then I thought it would be an interesting place to go and visit and the interview would be fun. He was then, I think, significantly disappointed to find out that the interview was by phone. And it was the last interview that uh, we probably did by phone ever at that point in time. But I like to think that his beautiful way of expressing things and his BBC accent were important uh, because they have provided us with a very valued colleague, someone who's done amazing things in this university um, and someone who we're very proud to have here. Um, I, I know in my first weeks uh, as Vice-Chancellor at the beginning of this year, I assembled a committee and, and Paul was one of those people who would turn up would simultaneously be reasonable and forthright, would simultaneously be thoughtful and radical, could speak truth to power in ways that were incredibly valuable for doing. Um, and I have thought since that there is no university group or subject where Paul is not an enormous asset. So following his, academic, his uh, PhD at Nottingham, he then moved briefly to De Montfort University before, as I've said, to making his way here into the School of Biological Sciences at Victoria University of Wellington. Um, he has ascended through the academic ranks as first as a senior lecturer and then associate professor and now as a member of the professoriate. Um, he is quintessentially an interdisciplinary researcher, someone who is sort of spanned across organic chemistry, biochemistry, medicinal chemistry, pharmacology and oncology. And I think if you look at his research work, and I think what we're about to hear tonight, I think does justice to that renaissance man that he is, able to combine orienteering and uh, in, uh, outside his day job with medicinal chemistry, with what, she, what he does within these walls. He's an internationally recognised expert. Uh, he's been cited an enormous number of times. He's secured over $4 million of external funding uh, and has won many research awards, including the highly prestigious Prime Minister Science Award. He's also known for his active external engagement. Uh, he's a subject specialist, uh, rev reviewing for major conferences, um, and he's also helped maintain important relationships with the Maligan uh, Institute of Medical Research and the Medical Research Institute of New Zealand. Um, he's made meaningful contributions in the leadership space of the university um, as an associate dean, uh, academic, uh, in the Faculty of Science, and has also been involved in a whole range of teaching and learning projects. He's one of the founding members of Afina and was the Director of Centre for Biodiscovery from two, 2015 to 2018. What we're about to hear Paul talk about, uh, I think, will be fantastic. Uh, he'll take a brief trip through complex biological processes of transcription and translation, um, he's going to look at some of the really unexpected mechanisms that control some of the earliest phases of protein production, which is essential for all our lives. And then we're going to see in that interdisciplinary spirit how na a natural product found in New Zealand, uh, sponges, can change the way that translocation is controlled and how that could lead to uh, really future uses in a whole range of innovative therapeutics. It's my enormous pleasure to welcome Professor Paul Teasdale Spittle. Thank you, Nick. So, uh, Vice Chancellor, one of guests, friends, family, colleagues, all others, it's a real pleasure to be here 
tonight and to see you here tonight as well. So thank you for that. I'm going to just slightly correct Nick's, um, Nick's introduction there. Sorry, Nick. Um, I, I commented as we, um, as we were sitting outside, one of the wonderful things about the, uh, the exhortations that are given on these occasions are things you, you learn about yourself that you never thought um, uh, one of those is, is the Prime Minister's Science Prize. So you're not hearing from a New Zealand Prime Minister's Science Prize winner tonight. I'm, it's just me. Uh, <laughs> so it's a great pleasure to be here. And um, I'm really delighted that at least one of you came and especially delighted that you all did. Um, my title tonight, Bringing Molecules to Life, was... Uh, after several seconds of deep thought about the nature of where I sit in the academic um, environment. And I ended up with a, a, a sort of a subtext that I wanted to bring in about the power and the value of curiosity and holding on to that curiosity as you go through life, as you go through uh, academia, and why I think we should instill it and nurture it in our students. So I'm going to start there. It's a, a little odd hobby horse, and then I'm going to move on. But hopefully you'll see that curiosity aspect has driven the, the research story that I'm going to take you through um, as we go. So um, I did consider trying to find pictures of my own children at a younger age. But those of you who've had younger children or can remember being one of those younger children will remember being surrounded by questions. The what, the why, the how, the when, the are we there yet? Uh, and so on. All of those questions, the deep search for meaning and ideas and exploration of the world. And that is a tremendous moment of growth. You see that in our youngsters. And then what happens when they come here? We do an awful lot of, learn this, there's this thing. Remember this, this statistic will be important to you. Here's a piece of knowledge. Uh, here's a feature. We, we do things that feel to me like occasionally we suppress that inquisitive nature. And I, I just pulled this up. I, something I was doing in my, uh, part of my role was looking at approving course outlines. Yay. Um, uh, fellow associate deans will, will know some of the, the joys of doing this. And I spotted one point. And I thought, that's quite a lot of assessments. And so I just pulled up one student from one of our programs who, it turned out this student was taking a course in th three different, four different courses from three faculties. And this is the 52 items of assessment that they're going to have next semester. So this student is going to have probably 100 or more assessments this year. And I wonder if they have time to ask the questions. So I'll leave you with that thought and I move on to, to try and start you thinking about what makes me curious. So what makes you curious here? Um, you might just for a moment look at somebody you can see around you and say, hmm, I wonder about. Go for it. And as you think and talk about this, you might have some, some surface questions like, those aren't buses, or how do you park a bus on that slope? But you then might start thinking some deeper questions as well. The more you think of just this image, the more you might begin to see in it. And it's a launching point for me, for curiosity. You might be thinking about, like, what's the social interactions between those sheep? Um, why the, the, There are rules and people are not sheep. I'm not following rules. <laughs> What's going on here? Um, what are the colours? Why is the glass green? Why is the paint blue? What are the materials? What can we do? What's, what's that wool good for? What's the physiology? There's an energy flow here. The sun is shining on the grass. The grass is absorbing that energy that is being transferred into the sheep. The sheep does some transfer of energy back to the grass. There's a, there's a whole connection of so much here. Uh, and there are so many things different things you might have drawn out your own curiosity from. For me, one of the things that excites me is understanding how stuff happens. 
And because of the nature of where I've come from academically, I have to understand from a molecule base upwards. Um, so thinking about how the stuff we observe around us, the processes that drive us, can be emergent from the properties of the molecules that make up living systems. So that is the bringing molecules to life. And that's the curiosity that I'm going to bring to the next bits of my talk. Before I go into my own research, though, I wanted to just give a little case study that we might all recognize some part of to think about how molecules interact in living systems and how there is real importance in that interaction being selective um, in processes. So I'm going to take you through this. There will be no test at the end of this on your knowledge of the cascade relating to coagulation. But what you might do, oh, let me get the um, laser pointer up, is see down at the bottom here, blood clot. So this is why we haven't all bled to death yet. Um, and at the base of this, the clotting of blood, above that, we have a protein called fibrin that helps form some of the, 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 the clot. And that forms because it gets chopped up by another protein. So this protein fibrinogen gets chopped up, makes fibrin. And the protein that does that chopping up is called thrombin. Okay, so you don't need to remember all of this. What I want you to think about, though, is that I've told you about a protein that chops up proteins. And if you know about proteins, you'll think about all of your muscles, you'll think about the workhorses of, of our biology, the things that make stuff happen in living systems. And yes, I've got a protein here that chops up proteins, which, if it was uncontrolled and unselective, would turn us into a bag of amino acids. That would not be good. So there has to be selectivity. So how is it that we can get blood clotting and not just turning into a, a soup of amino acids? And I'm going to try and take you through this from my view of how molecules work. Good luck. Right. What I've shown you up on the, on the screen here is a surface of this protein thrombin. And it's color-coded. So the color coding tells you about charge on the surface. Blue bits are positively charged. Red bits are negatively charged. And you'll also see, in addition to charge features, it's got shape. It's got structure. It's got cavities and protrusions. And these combinations of cavities and protrusions and surface properties give a particular point of the protein features that allow it to select what other proteins it chops up. So there's an example here, one of the, uh, the substrates that thrombin cuts in that previous slide, there, shown just as a molecular skeleton. And if we dig down deeper, look in closer, zoom in on the active site, the place where the cleaving up of this substrate occurs, you begin to see the surface features of the protein, that's the, the red, white, blue surface, and how it matches lumps and bumps that you can infer from the skeleton I've shown you of, this, of the substrate. So there's points where there's a cavity and there's another, uh, the, the substrate has to have something that fills that cavity. And that's what gives it selectivity. All the way across this long interface, things have to be matched. The features of the substrate have to match the features of the protein. So if there's a cavity in the protein, the substrate must put, put something in it. If there's a protrusion in the protein, then the substrate mustn't have something there. And that then governs which proteins get bound and chopped up and which don't. And I'll take you through one example of this, which is right at the very point where all the clever chemistry of the enzyme happens, where it chops up its substrate. There is an interaction for the substrate, which is shown in white, um, the the thrombin shown here in yellow, this sort of molecular detail of amino acids of the protein. And the, the substrate has this long amino acid with a sort of finger-like protrusion that sticks in to a cavity, we'll see it in a, moment, in a moment, and has a positive charge at the end. So this amino acid arginine in the substrate is the only amino acid 
that is long and protruding and has a positive charge at the end. Uh, it's not quite the only one. It's the best one for this. And it meets up with an amino acid that's negatively charged from the protein. So it's got this lovely match of charge and positioning. And we can even dig into the surface. So I've shown the surface we saw earlier, and I've just chopped away the front of it so we can look into the pocket. And you can see in this pocket, it's just like the perfect size, the perfect fit. So this, this finger of the arginine amino acid is just protruding down into that pocket, filling it and making that ideal perfect plus minus interaction at the bottom. And that's just one of the many interactions that's happening right across the surface of this protein. So why have we not bled to death or turned into a bag of amino acids? Because this protein thrombin cleaves up particular substrates. It picks out from all of the 25 to 100,000 variants of proteins that make us up. It picks out just a few to chop because they have to have exactly these features. Nothing else. All right. So what we've just seen then is we can begin to understand biological processes, big and important biological processes, from the molecular level upwards. We can think about the charge, the shape, the features, the interactions, and how complementarity of one thing to another ensures that selectively one molecule binds to another, building up an assembly that is functional. And so we begin to go from molecule to biological process, and that's what's been my curiosity, if you like. All right, I'm going to take an aside because I think you only want me to say molecule, uh, electrostatic interaction, hydrogen bond, and so on, so many times um, in a talk. So I thought I would just break for a moment as an aside. How did I get here? And I don't mean I walked in, Nick made sure I came in the right direction. Dave escorted me behind so I didn't run away. I'm meaning academically. So um, uh, you've seen a picture of me when I was quite young. This is me as a, as a teenager at school. Um, blessedly few photographs of me as a, as a child. The, uh, the beauty of growing up before that digital camera era, I'm sure I'm not alone in thinking, ah, my parents really only could take a few photographs at a time. Um, right. So I made a few decisions as I went along. As going through school, there was only one subject I ever actively chose not to do, and that is biology. <laughs> At the age of 14, where the first set of choices I had before me, Latin, yes, biology, no way. <laughs> Absolutely no way. So um, don't do biology. The next thing, going a year or two up and choosing what to do at university, I had two goals I set myself in mind. The first was, my grandfather did chemistry, my father did chemistry, I'm going to be different. And the second was, don't end up living in Birmingham or London. Don't go in the big city, find somewhere else. How did that go? Well, I very, very successfully not ended up living in Birmingham or London. <laughs> um, but what I do now might be described as molecular pharmacology. That is, thinking about the molecular basis of therapeutic agents, what, what they do, how they work, how things interact, as I've just shown you, how the cellular consequences of those interactions play out for therapeutic benefit. So what I'm saying is, that chemistry I wasn't going to do, well, I did do it at university, and that biology I decided was an awful subject and I should give up, that's where I found my home. So, um, right. So that brings me to the point where I want to say something a little bit about the research that I've been doing over the years. I've been absolutely blessed to work with a whole number of excellent people and be able to uh, dabble in a range of projects across mm, a few disciplines. And I've decided to tell you today about just one of these, which is the story relating to a New Zealand natural product called petiamine. Petiamine is found in uh, one of our native sponges, so the Michaeli sponge, and it's not found in every sponge that you can find that is a Michaeli sponge, which suggests that it's actually produced by something else, and it's a bacterial bacteria that produces it. But... Uh, what I want to do on this slide, though, is to recognise some people. So 
anything I tell you today has the work of other people rather than my own. And um, uh, pictures of colleagues, so uh, Peter Northcote and Rob Kaisers, uh, who are aficionados of, of natural products. Um, Joanne Harvey, who has been an incredible collaborator for decades. Hmm. Yeah, uh, uh, and is an absolute guru of all things synthetic organic chemistry. Um, so John Miller, who um, was one of the first people I met as I arrived here, who dragged me into this world of thinking about how natural products work and um, determining mode of action. Bill Jordan, Lee Feng Pong, who uh, got me into thinking and understanding the world of proteomics and the way that the cellular consequences of, um, of, of treatments with things like bioactive compounds can be interpreted. Melanie, um, who, if she is here, she's apparently sneezing. I can't hear sneezing, so that probably means she's still at home. Who's uh, uh, brought me into the world of glioblastoma. Gary, who, uh, who worked with us on this project with synthetic organic chemistry, Gary Evans. And Anne Laflamme, who is one of the least scary immunologists. There are, there are a few. <laughs> right. And then, really, those are the colleagues who have supported me through the years. But there are people as well who actually did the work. And uh, I see Veronica in the room here, um, uh, but there are many, many others as well. So to them, for anything I get wrong now, that's my fault. Um, and also to them, in case they're watching online and Veronica in the room here, I'm gonna take your blood, your sweat, your tears, and then just make it sound quite small. Um, it's not. Uh, anybody who's done a PhD will know the blood, sweat, and tears that go into a, a one sentence statement. All right, and along the way, we've been funded, and particularly in this area, funded by Worldwide Cancer Research, Genesis Oncology Trust, and the university supporting people through scholarships. So with grateful thanks for that support. Okay, so, aha, a molecule. You knew it was going to come back. So this is pityamine. Um, it's, this is its structure. For those of you who are more chemistry-based, you'll see a macrodialide with a thiazole and an extended polyunsaturated alkenic um, side chain with a tertiary amine at the end. For everybody else, it's a glorious little bit of structure. Um, it's unique. There aren't other natural products that look much like this. Um, it's a, an interesting challenge, and, um, and it does things. Amongst the things it does is kill cells. So let me explain the chart I've got here. So this chart here is showing you cell survival. And as we move from left to right, we're increasing the amount of pityamine in the treatment. And cells go, yeah, 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 ooh, ah, e -e oh, and then they don't say anything. You get to a, a, a concentration and all the cells in your, your flask that you treated have died. And the concentrations where this is happening are in a, a range called the nanomolar range, which means there's, there's virtually nothing there. So it's an incredibly potent toxic compound in a marine sponge. And... I said that there were sort of curiosity elements throughout my talk. This is one of these. So Peter Northcote, who, was, uh, who discovered pityamine um, back in the days when he was in Canterbury, um, he was struck by the fact that we have organisms that cannot move. You know, the sponges can't fight off um, or run away from predators. So they must defend themselves in other ways. And his view was maybe there's a chemical defense. And I wonder what that is. And when Peter went looking for what that chemical defense might be, one of the compounds he found was pityamine. And that sort of stuck around as being, it's a toxic compound for a while. We got a bit interested in it because we realized that there was more going on than just it kills things. Um, I'll just go back to that. We really wanted to think about what this was good for. This was something unique to New Zealand. It's a natural product that our, one of our sponges make that is not made anywhere else, or rather one of the bacteria in our sponges make, that is not made anywhere else. And I wonder if it is good for something. That's a little uh, nod towards this. Um, um, some of you will know his, his sort of catchphrase, what's it good for? Um, when you look at that killing of cells that I told you, I've got some numbers here. Low numbers mean really, really, really potent at killing those cells. And then you'll see there are two numbers in red, which are not low numbers. These are cells that don't apparently mind if you treat them with pityamine. And I've used the word quiescent. These are cells that are not going through division. 
So we've got some cells which are going through division regularly, and if they're going through division, they really, really, really do not respond well to pteumine. They die. But if they're not going through division, then they just keep surviving. What's going on there? So there's a question, but uh, it does begin to answer the maybe what is this good for because where is an interesting therapeutic situation where uncontrolled division of cells is a bad thing and being able to kill cells that are going through uncontrolled division would be a good thing is cancer. So you have immediately here the potential that we've got a, a window into cancer because those uncontrolled division that, that is associated with the development of tumours, for instance, is going to be targeted by this compound. So we have a beginning of a what is this good for? But there were all sorts of other questions that we might have had at the time, like why does it do that? What's the ecological benefit? How does it do that? What's causing that to happen? Um, along the side, why, if I've got this thing that's really, really toxic, does the thing that produces it not die? I'm not going to answer that one tonight. I'm just going to leave you worrying about it. Um, and then always the, what is this good for? There's no point in, in, in not thinking about whether we've got benefits in what we do. To get to that, we decided this was the most important place to start. How is it doing it? Because if we understood how we might be able to think about why and what and some of those other questions. So the how question here was most important for us. And so we did this. Mm. We made a mess on a slide. What this is describing is, is, a, is a process. So we started by taking some cells, some, just some normal culturable cells. That we, this is the thing we do. Um, so we grow up cells and then we burst them apart, got the protein contents out of them, and we went fishing. I see Paul at the back as a fisherman. Uh, we went fishing on a molecular level for, uh, for proteins that bound to, uh, to our pteumine. And when we did that, we went through a series of processes. We used mass spectrometry to identify those processes. We double-checked that the proteins that we found related to the activity we were seeing and so we got an answer. And James Matthews, who was doing the work at that point, I remember quite well that moment he came down, having finished this collection of, of complex experiments, and he said, we've got a target, it's EIF4A. To which I said the only thing I could imagine saying at that point, great, uh, what is it? Um, as it happens, neither James nor I knew anything about EIF4A, uh, I'm imagining relatively few of you here do as well, so I'm going to tell you. Ha, ha, this is the, the problem you have, you see. You've come, you're now a captive audience, and only Richard's told me that he's going to go and run away partway through. Right, okay, so to get there, I'm going to introduce the central dogma, which sounds like it's some sort of religious thing. Um, the central dogma, as I'm going to tell you today, um, came about around the late 50s, uh, associated with Francis Crick. And they were, Crick was thinking about the passage of information. And his idea was, or their idea was, really, information passes from nucleic acid to nucleic acid. So nucleic acids are things like DNA, which we think of as like the blueprint of the cell. And it's got a, 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 a friend that we'll look at in a moment called RNA. So information can pass from DNA to RNA, and information can pass from nucleic acid to protein, so from RNA to, pro to proteins. And we've got names that we're going to give to these two processes. One, the first one is the writing across of sequence information, so writing across or transcription of sequence information from DNA to RNA. And the next is the translation of the nucleic acid code to the protein code, um, so that's translation. And Crick's definition here of information was specifically about the sequence of subunits. So it's how one thing drives the sequence of the next. So visually, then, we have cells. There you go. I told you Richard would run away. <laughs> um, I thought he'd wait till I really offended him. But Right. Um, in, our, in our cells, we, uh, there is a nucleus which is packed tight with DNA, 
amongst other things. Uh, huge lengths of DNA packed up, really knotted up tightly. This DNA has that blueprint that we, we hear people describe, the blueprint of life. It's got this lovely double helical type structure. It creates actually far more complex structures than this, but this will work for us now. But because of its length, you can't just take a bit of it out and use it. This blueprint is locked up in the nucleus, and you have to copy bits out when you want them to be used. So that's this process of transcription, writing across into a shorter length of nucleic acid. And that bit of nucle nucleic acid, this RNA, carries a message which can be taken out into the rest of the cell and translated and turned into proteins. So it's called messenger RNA, mRNA. And that provides a sequence of these protrusions you can see here, which you might notice look very similar to these in the middle of the double helix of DNA. This is the sequence or the bases of a nucleic acid which have slightly different structures from each other. They are a code. We often give them four letters. I'm going to show you some of those in a bit. The sequence of these letters of these bases defines the information content of this bit of RNA. And every three of those gives a specific message that says, translate this into one particular amino acid, like that arginine I showed you earlier in thrombin. So one particular bit of that code will say, put this arginine in this place in, uh, in thrombin. Okay. So I need to now tell you a bit about RNA. These are so many things you didn't know you didn't want to know about. Right, so RNA is a bit different to that beautiful double helix that you might think about for DNA. So it's often thought about as less likely to form double helical structures. It might be single-stranded. It's relatively short compared to the sort of meters length of bits of DNA. It does have double helical bits, so it gets uh, pairings up, but it has regions that are not as well. So it has these interesting complex structures and loops and knots and all sorts of things in it. It also has some sequence bits that are really important to know about. So uh, it has to say, here beginneth my message. Um, the, in this case, I've shown you a, a code on a group of three uh, bases, A, U, G, that say, start here. This is where the bit that's going to make a protein begins. And then it carries on through the chain with the sequence that will code for the, uh, for the protein. And then at some point, it has to say, oh, and stop. Don't just keep going. Stop here. So it has a start codon and a stop codon, and it gets bits either end. And in the middle, then, between the start and the stop is, stop, is called the coding region. And this is the bit that governs what specific protein is made. Right. So that feels like it's really, really important. And that's the bit I want you to ignore. I want you to look at this bit, particularly the thing that I'm going to call the 5 prime UTR. So before the start is some sort of sequence. I've shown it with a little loop here, but it could be any structure, any length. Some sort of sequence which is not translated. So it's in the untranslated region. Uh, so that's what UTR stands for, if I drop into saying 5 prime UTR. And the 5 prime just denotes which end. Don't worry about why. Richard will tell you afterwards about the, um, the numbering of, uh, of sugars and why that ended up being a 5 prime. Anyway, it's a, a bit that isn't part of the sequence, but is really fundamentally important in how the transcript, this bit of RNA, is managed. And we're finally getting to me being able to get you to understand the wonderful world of EIF4A. So I'm going to call it 4A because that's shorter. Um, in that 5 prime untranslated region, there might be knots and loops and features that make it really hard for the molecular assembly that makes proteins to come in and clip on to the transcript, to this bit of RNA, and then start churning around and, and making the protein. So if, it's, if this 5 prime UTR is full of structure and knots and complexity, then that transcript can't be used. And what 4A does is it melts away those bits of structure. So it 
dissolves them away, so you get a sort of like a nice flat landing pad, so that the molecular assembly, which is called a ribosome, can sort of assemble around the start codon and start using this transcript to make proteins. Brilliant. You now know everything you need to know about EIF4A and um, RNA, and my job is done. But I'm going to talk anyway. So what happens then with pitiamine? Pitiamine sort of inhibits. It's actually, a, uh, it sort of over-activates, but we're going to pretend it inhibits EIF4A. And the reason that's important is that these transcripts that have long and really structured and knotty five prime untranslated regions have that for an evolutionary reason. Why, after all, would you try, why would nature end up creating a complexity that needs to be resolved in order to make a protein that it, a cell needs to be made? That doesn't make great evolutionary sense unless we can think of some other reason. And the reason is that not every protein needs to be made at the same rate. There's all sorts of stuff in control um, that controls what proteins get, uh, get made. But one of the last steps is this initiation step. And proteins where the cell absolutely needs to have as many breaks as possible on their unregulated production have these complex, long, structured, knotty 5' prime UTRs that really, really depend on the assembly of proteins that includes EI4A. And these include cancer-promoting genes. So these are genes that you would not normally want turned on. If you want to talk about why we have genes like this, Peter in the front row over there will probably tell you about their importance in developmental biology. There are some friends of yours, I suspect, somewhere in here, Peter. Yeah, so... Um, so the cell has these mechanisms for controlling these cancer-promoting genes. One of these is the knottiness of its uh, 5' prime UTR. EIF4A is really important in, in untangling that knottiness so they can be made when they are needed. Okay, which means that if we inhibit them, what is the process that we most inhibit? It's going to be the inhibition of things that turn on and promote cancer. Yeah, that's good. So that helps us explain this. So two things are going on. Um, the first then is that we can turn off cancer-promoting genes, which means that some of the survival benefits that uh, cancer cell lines might have inherent in them are suddenly turned off. So they become more sensitive to, to the pityamine. And another thing is that cells that are going through division need proteins all the time. What's the next step of the cell division? Oh, I need proteins to do that. What's my next thing? I need a protein to do that. So they're really respondent to, to dropping off uh, protein synthesis. So we've got a really exciting target for cancer. We have a, a unique New Zealand natural product that hits this target, and we're in a good place. So 2005 it was that we've uh, James walked in and said, Ha-ha, we found an EIF4A. I wonder what it is. By about 2014, then the global search for uses of that piece of information um, drove more and more work, us and others, on understanding that led us to the, this point of it's the sequence of the bit of the transcript that's not tr translated that's really important here. It's like the bit you don't normally think about is the important bit. Um, and then 2019, a, a company in the US called Effector Therapeutics uh, picked, uh, have been working with, uh, the, as part of this community of people working in the EIF4A inhibition world, um, driven by us back then. Uh, and they've got their, uh, their first compound, Zotifin, in, Zotifin, sorry, in uh, clinical trials. It's an exciting moment. They promise that they will have their trials wrapped up the first couple of stages of trials wrapped up by September this year. So we hope well for them, particularly those of us who um, don't want EIF4A to fall over as a drug target. So we're hoping. But so far, what they say of their own trials is promising. We'll have to see what the real data uh, shows, of course. Right. So job done.
We found a target. That's actually a really exciting place to be. It's not often you get to find a new therapeutic target. Rich has had a couple. Um, but, uh, sorry, not the Richard who ran away, the Richard for, um, who's still here. Yeah, um, we found a cancer specific benefit. We've, it's been exploited. We, uh, we have a problem, Patiamine is, is, as a natural product, we can get the odd milligram of it if we work really hard. That's not enough to treat a person, um, or it's certainly not enough to treat many people, and it's not enough to do preclinical trials, clinical trials, and so on. So is there anything yes to do, left to do? Yes. So in my remaining ooh, 10 minutes, let me tell you some of the where are we going with this? So the first one I mentioned, glioblastoma. Um, some of Veronica is in the third row back here. Some of her work uh, from a year or so ago. Uh, glioblastoma is an awful, awful cancer. Um, so you, many of you may be aware of it. It's, it's a killer. Um, it's the, the lifetime, once you've got diagnosis, is, is months. It's, it's not long. It may last out for years, but it's generally not. It's one of the trickiest treatments to uh, cancers to treat, and when you treat it, it comes back, and it comes back worse, usually. So we thought, well, we've got this really exciting compound. I wonder if it works there. I'm showing you again the self-survival curves. You can see it looked like before. You push up the amount of patiamine, cells fall over. So we can kill cell models, at least, of glioblastoma. That's a bit exciting. Um, and um, the work Veronica spent, um, spent a year on was, was looking at what are the cellular processes associated with this. Um, and we can, we can pick particular parts of the, the cellular response to patiamine, and we can think about how that interacts with the nature of the biology of, of uh, glioblastoma. But I'm not going to do that for you now, because it's too much detail, perhaps. But there are some things, there are places where all of that takes us. So the first is... If we had enough of the compound, does it cross the bl blood-brain barrier? Am I just wasting my time thinking about glioblastoma? Uh, does it get across the blood-brain barrier? Does it survive uh, metabolic processes? Um, and what about a more realistic model of glioblastoma? You can kill cells, but it's not the same as treating the disease. So, so there's definitely things um, to be done there, but there's enough to make it exciting to ask some of the more questions. The next one um, arose from a combination of our thinking about the nature of the five prime untranslated reason and also from uh, some examples in the literature. So, for example, viruses use our protein making machinery to replicate. They don't come with protein making machinery. They get into a cell and go, please make this protein for me. Well, they don't please. It's more of a demand. Uh, and, and we're interacting with, uh, with this protein-making machinery, so it made sense uh, for somebody to get on and look at uh, viral impacts. It turned out to be um, uh, from some collaborators or some other, other people, but patiamine impacts on influenza and a whole range of other viruses. So there's something happening there that's really important, because in the cell model that they're using here that I'm showing coloured spots off that I'm not going to explain. Um, the cells survive, the virus is not replicating. So we are having an effect below toxicity. So we can do something that's not killing things. That's nice. And another thing you can do that's not killing things is, is uh, relates to cachexia. So cachexia is muscle wasting. And you might uh, think of conditions, you might know people who lose total muscle tone, they've become thin or skeletal. This is not to do with the diet, but it's to do with the condition that they are experiencing. And it's not well treated. And patiamine, at least in the mouse model, prevents it. So that's, that's a remarkably powerful thing. And particularly powerful is that the mouse mice are healthy and happy and not experiencing toxicity, and the dosage is really, really low. So we wanted to take these two things and ask the how's that happening sort of question because how are we getting effects that are beneficial without turning off all protein synthesis and then killing the organism? That would be bad. Antiviral that kills virus, ideal, kills you, not ideal. Right, so 
we went back to thinking about the structures of five prime UTRs. Some simple transcripts have very little structure. It doesn't really matter what you do treating with pityamine. As long as you don't put too much in, then their proteins get made, and they get made, and they get made. You need to have a really high concentration to stop their production. And then when you do that, the cell dies. That's not good. Then you have some cells, some transcripts which have these structure loops and turns and knots. They're really sensitive to disruption. So if you begin to lower the available functional amount of this EIF4A protein, then they can't be made. They can't be translated. And so their proteins drop out. And that might be some of what's happening with the anti-cancer, the antiviral world. But we were getting really effects at really low concentrations. And we began to think that pateamine and EIF4A picked out certain features in this untranslated region and locked on the 4A protein to a feature of the untranslated region. And that particular transcript it just couldn't be processed. And that could happen at really, really low concentrations. So really low concentrations. So Richard Little, who spent years doing vastly more than I'm showing here, was able to show that at concentrations that don't affect the cell survival in any way, shape, or form, that around 4% of the proteins in the cells drop in abundance. And we think there's some feature of their untranslated region which makes them particularly prone to having 4A and patemine lock onto it, and then they are not processed, so they just disappear, they drop into a thing called a stress granule. And some proteins, by the way, go up. Um, that might be to do with the fact that you've now got ribosomes going, well, my transcript's gone, what shall I do? Oh, I'll make more of that other protein. Anyway, not to worry about that. What we wanted to do was identify what the feature of the, um, the 5 prime UTR was. Richard looked at a whole range of structural predictions and a number of other things that we could uh, work on. And we came down to this information, um, a Crick's sequence information. There are sequence motifs which every transcript that drop down in abundance have. And you see letters G and A quite big here. So these are the sequence letters for guanine and adenine in the, the RNA code. And if you get this long stretch of these purine, guanine, adenine bases in the RNA, it's, it's like a magnet for the EIF4A. And it sits in that sequence, gets locked in place with pateamine. And the, the transcripts that have this feature then drop out. And that is probably what's giving us some of these subtoxic effects, which is great. Being able to treat a disease without being toxic is... Very, very useful. So uh, we've moved away from cancer and we're starting to think about other uses. Um, and we now know in the molecular level how this is happening. So we've got a crystal structure of, of EIF4A. This is color-coded, the red for negative, blue for positive, like I showed you earlier. Uh, but this is our EIF4A protein, just a bit of its surface. In gold is the RNA and in the, the white skeleton is our pateamine. And you can see how they sit snuggled together, making this combination of things that, that interlock, um, where they're held in position, they can't separate out, and that bit of RNA cannot be processed. And the selectivity that I've just talked about from the sequence selectivity is driven by all of those interactions. So how is the RNA interacting with the protein? How is the RNA interacting with our pateamine? And how is our pateamine interacting with the protein? These interfaces are really where all of that selectivity and all of the potential therapeutic uses is, is hidden. It's locked in, that locked in that interface realm. So we wanted to think about how we work on that interface. And that we can't change the structure of EIF4A, so that can't be done. We can't change the structure of our transcripts. Well, there's many of them. But we, uh, so they provide a variety of, of, of features, but we can change pateamine. So we thought we'd have a look at that. And so we thought about the interfaces. The interfaces occur particularly across this region, which is down through here, across this region, this long extended region, which is through here, and our, our thiazole, the sulfur nitrogen containing ring here, which points into the, the, the surface of the protein. And so we saw these as points where we could tweak 
the molecule and then tweak the interface, tweak the interactions and maybe change the, the selectivity. And also along the way, we hope to make it a bit easier to make, didn't we, Joanne? <laughs> yeah, so we had this great idea and we actually did make something that was quite easy to make. We thought we would take some pretty standard chemistry steps, try and simplify the molecule down, um, pick up some simple precursors. These are honestly relatively simple precursors. We can even just buy this bit, which makes a whole chunk of the molecule. You just go to the chemical supplier and say, give me some grams of that, please. So this is a really quick way in. And we decided to use a reaction that makes a different sort of ring. It's still got five members, but this has got three nitrogens. So this triazole ring. So uh, this, this reaction here that is denoted QAC, copper-assisted azide alkyne cycloaddition, is, is a, become a, a workhorse in parts of the chemistry biology interface. It's been known as an archetypal example of a click reaction. So it's, that means it's, it's reliable, it works every time you do it, in theory, as long as you get conditions right. It's reproducible, um, and, it, uh, and it's applied in all sorts of different contexts. And we thought, great, we can knock this together with a click reaction, we can buy this, we can make some other components which are not too complex, and we can put together an analog of pityamine, which we did. It's not very active. It's about a thousand-fold less active than pityamine, sadly. So we've overdone the simplification. Um, so we decided to work on that, think about the things we had done that were a bit different. One was the this ring is different, so we wanted to go back to the original nitrogen sulfur-containing rings, this thiazole here, and, um, and in a dreadful misservice to about three people's blood, sweat, and tears over a combined eight years, <laughs> uh, well, perhaps. So uh, Tao, um, uh, Claire, Sarah, particularly working on this, this reaction, we were trying to recreate the benefits of the click reaction using a gold catalyst and some oxidative gold, uh, gold catalyzed oxidative coupling to get to the thiazole that we wanted. And we were able to get there. We've got this... This beginning part, we just got to extend from a handle here out to attach the, the side shape, the, the equivalent of this bit here. And then we'll have our next analogue. So that's where we're up to synthetically, the goal being to get enough of this compound that we can actually start looking more realistically at, uh, at therapeutic use and also can we tune it for its selectivity. So what comes next here? We need more compound. So we've got to make more. Um, that will require the next grant application and, um, and, and success in that next grant application. We want to be, think about whether we can tune the selectivity to tune these things like the antiviral activity or the anticachectic activity. But one of the really interesting, oh, I wonder where this will take us, curiosity moments, is back through our central dogma here. DNA made into RNA. It's not all DNA that's all simultaneously copied. There are messages that say, make this bit. We need this bit to be copied. Please use this bit. And the messages that help regulate which bits are opened up and copied and used and passed on for translation are all driven by proteins. And what is it that we're affecting? We're affecting the production of proteins. So... Some of the proteins that we're affecting the production of are the regulators of this process. So we've got this lovely regulate the regulator thing going on, which those of you who are in criminology might know more about than I do, but we've got this happening in the biological process. Um, and in particular, some of these really powerful biological observations like being anti antiviral, or particularly the anticachectic, this turning off muscle wasting, is, feels like it's not some random protein that we're impacting, but like a suite of coordinated proteins that are involved in this condition. And are we regulating a protein that changes the response of that whole suite of different proteins that are associated with cachexia? And, uh, and so that is where we're going now. We've got evidence that we are amongst the proteins here that we're affecting at really low concentration of things called transcription factors that regulate this process of transcription. So that's where we're going now. So there's more questions, more questions and more questions. And may there always be more questions. 
as long as they're not, are we there yet? <laughs> All right, so one of the things I realized is I have a chance to do something that I never have a chance to do before in any academic talk. And that is, along the way on any academic journey, journey there are people who mentor you and there are people who inspire you. There are people for whom just the way they do things make you think about what you're doing. And uh, quite a few of you are here, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, the people who influence the way you are, I approach the world, this is some of them, but I've been surrounded by great collaborators. I've shown you a few of them before in the Patiamin story, but in other things I've done as well, there's been so many. I've been lucky in the colleagues that I've had in biological sciences throughout, through, through chemistry and throughout the Faculty of Science who've, um, as I said, put up with me or maybe enriched my time here over the years. It's been particularly, particularly valuable to me that, that what you have contributed to my life. Um, talking of which, um, I've got to mention family. So Sarah, who back in 1987 probably had no idea that she would be sitting here this many years later. So thank you, Sarah. Uh, for, for these two, my sons, Simon and Alan, whose can-do attitude, or at least can-do until broken attitude, <laughs> yes, you two, um, uh, it is a, a continual inspiration. Um, I had no idea how they get so broken. Um, <laughs> Uh, so the, the, you know, those people who keep me on the ground, who deal with the fact that I might turn up late and start babbling nonsense, thank you to you all. Right, and thank you to you for talking, for listening to me babbling nonsense to you tonight. It's been a pleasure to have a captive audience. Thank you. Kira, thanks, Paul. You don't get to escape yet, um, nor does the audience. Um, <laughs> I'm Professor Dave Harper. I'm the Deputy Pro Vice Chancellor of the Faculties of Science, Health, Engineering, Architecture, and Design Innovation. And my role right now is to, and I'm delighted to do this, is to give the vote of thanks to Paul um, for tonight's lecture. So to be promoted to Professor doesn't require just one thing. You need to be an excellent researcher. You need to be an excellent academic teacher. Um, and you need to show leadership in a whole range of um, engagement-based ways. And so Paul, as a leader in the Faculty of Science and the School of Biological Sciences over the year, you've shown exemplary leadership, particularly in developing new programs, um, and you've helped keep the university at the forefront of innovative teaching and learning in Aotearoa. Uh, tonight, we got a glimpse of your research and uh, research background. Um, you've taught us one take-home message, which I, um, I was about to say painfully re was reminded, um, of the molecular biologist's tendency to come up with the most obscure names for things. Five yes. prime UTR, <laughs> EIF4A. Um, yes, you reminded me of that. Um, these are complex things. Um, th things like transcription, translation to pro cellular processes that Paul led, led us through in terms of understanding the take-home messages, at least my ones, were not necessarily the obscure names around these things, but that they help develop useful therapies, whether it's muscle wasting, cancer, viral infections. And in this day that we've sort of become kind of focused thanks to COVID, COVID's to blame for all sorts of things on mRNA-based uh, vaccines, you reminded me tonight of the importance um, and the ongoing importance of biodiscovery, the use of natural products and their application into cellular biology and therapeutics. And that was a really important reminder tonight. So with researchers like yourself leading the way, Aotearoa is in a very good place to continue leading the world in terms of drug discovery and development. Now for a personal note. Um, those of you who have put, um, put up with my inaugural thank yous before know that there's something coming. Um, I'm very pleased Paul made it here tonight. I'm pleased you all made it here tonight, but particularly Paul, um, otherwise it would have been a very empty lecture. But it, I believe it was 23 years ago, uh, more or less, on this very same week that you missed your welcome party at the School of Biological Sciences. <laughs> so when I walked into the Victoria room before, the first thing I said is, thank God you're here, because it would have been a very short evening. So he turned up tonight. 
Now, to understand what Paul has brought to the university over the years since missing his own welcome, is to recognise, as the Vice-Chancellor mentioned, he's been a Programme Director, a Director of a Cross-Disciplinary Research Centre, a Head of School, an Associate Dean, and occasionally an Acting Dean. Um, and it's not just in his various roles that he's epitomised academic leadership, but also his involvement in all sorts of random things. He's a great citizen of the university. Um, so he's been involved in further developments of the Bachelor of Biomedical Science, um, Biotechnology, goodness knows what other programs in your role as Associate Dean, uh, numerous building projects, including Close to Ecology Lab, McDermott Building, Tutukirata, um, last year being co-opted by a particular deputy PVC into taking over discussions on Wellington Science City. Um, that was me, by the way. Um, and even agreeing to be sent to Vietnam to pro promote a biotechnology teaching program when as dean of the day, me again, uh, said, decided I didn't want to go. So great citizen in terms of standing, stepping up and doing the things I didn't want to do. Um, <laughs> I think one of the things that's made Paul such a great part of our VUW community is his commitment and willingness to go that little bit extra. Um, one of the best illustrations, if I haven't given enough already, was last year when Paul and I were in a, um, a development, professional development uh, session together, and it was all on Zoom, and the rest of us, it was early winter morning, probably this time of year, the rest of us were, because um, it was being led out of the UK, so it was in the middle of the night for them, um, we're all sort of in our bedrooms or lounges in our jammies, staying warm. Paul joined over Zoom with a phone strapped to the front of his bicycle as he cycled into <laughs> the university in order to both partake in the professional development session as well as be in time to deliver his lecture. That's what Paul does. Um, <laughs> So, however, when I asked him what he considered one of his greatest achievements at Victoria, he said, nothing like what you heard tonight, um, or what I've mentioned, he said it was being able to understand an entire Dave Harper, me again, 10-minute monologue, and then summarise it in one sentence. And I have to admit, over the years, I've come to be more and more comfortable with a scenario in which I talk, and I talk until the words stop coming out, to look over to Paul. Paul looks at me, he then looks at the rest of the room, and he says, what Dave really means is... X, and it's delivered in one sentence. I look at Paul, I look to the room, and I say, that's what, exactly what Paul says. So that's, that's one of his best skills, his superpower. Um, okay, I'd like to close by saying that we all know how important support networks are. Paul illustrated some of those that he's very thankful for. And I wanted to acknowledge Paul's networks, um, like his professional network, wide and varied. Thank you to your colleagues, students, past and present. Friends, neighbours, including friends from the orienteering community who are here um, tonight, I believe. Um, and finally, and perhaps most importantly, I'd like to acknowledge Paul's family for your unwavering support, um, Sarah and your sons, Simon and Alan. So, Paul, it's my pleasure to recognise you for what a fantastic inaugural professorial lecture you've given, and I'd like you all to invite you all through to... Um, the common room, back through there, um, for refreshments, and Paul will answer all sorts of questions about transcription and translation to your heart's content. Once again, thank you very much, Paul.